I was at a conference a few weeks ago, and um, I got to know that there are no maps of deserts. Um, why? Because the landscape constantly changes. Um, there are no real reference points to be found. So if you're to travel in the desert, you need this kind of instrument. A good compass is what you need. I, know that I thought that idea was a little bit interesting because uh, that made me think about our society today where we have very few uh, reference points. Uh, we get a lot of information uh, onto which it's very difficult to base decisions. You know? We sometimes call it greenwash, you know? washed with information. And that will make us have difficulties to point out a direction. This is a goal we have. You know, the conference in Copenhagen coming up, we're supposed to focus on two degrees. I think that's kind of an interesting goal. I would think that if I was a lobbyist for the industry that creates this uh, climate change, if you call it that, the race of temperature, I would find this the ideal goal because uh, you can well imagine when we pass these two degrees, what would the kind of procedure be, you know? We would call in a kind of a trial, and what would be said during this trial? I, I could imagine that they would say, we really tried, you know, it didn't work. <laughs> um, or they would say that, it was actually you who decided. You were the one. We only provided you with the stuff. You were using it. You know. You went to the pump and filled your car. Um, you voted for the politicians that made those decisions to invest in infrastructure that created the need for certain types of transportation systems, which in in turn created this um, change. <laughs> that what you can imagine, huh? I have a friend, because if you want to have real information to base your decisions on, it's very difficult to find it. This is a colleague of mine at Lund University, Stefan Anderberg. He's really into uh, commodities in the sense that he is, he's interested in where things come from and the kind of uh, resource flows um, into the world economy. And he showed me this a few weeks ago, which is... Um, consumption of cement and then you think cement why is that interesting uh, he told us that this is a, a very good indicator of um, economic activity or you know but something is being built that's quite easy to imagine you have cement you mix it with water and gravel and you build stuff you know, buildings infrastructure and the next thing is that you will fill it with something. You will have heating systems, you will have furniture, you will have you know, electronic equipment, and that will raise consumption. And this figure is showing that the consumption will be bigger, not smaller. You can imagine. Because if you like commodities, you should look at Financial Times. There's a tiny little square at one page saying commodity prices, which a lot of people follow in the world. <coughs> and that's where you know, most of the economy, where, where, where the kind of inflows into the economy comes from basic commodities. And if you look at them, uh, like Stefan Anderberg has done, you see that uh, the, the use is increasing. And you see the, especially the concrete there, which is uh, uh, increasing enormously. And it seems that the concrete leads to higher consumption of fossil fuels. Huh? seems to be kind of following each other. Most of what we refer to as a modern society, and when it comes to transportation, is related to petroleum. Um, it's quite nicely illustrated with all the means of transportation that we use it for. Sweden, we use 97% fossil fuel for our transportation system. It was quite remarkably. And of course, there are for new reasons, I try to, you, I'm not expected that you can read all this, but I try to map up uh, uh, kind of a timeline and try to see what are the kind of invention that has led us up to this consumption level which we are at today. And I just 
pointed out a few things. You can see for yourself, you know, first, agriculture, uh, written language, packaging systems, storing, you know, creating economy, enough for doing other things than just working with the soil, uh, printing, steam aging, James Watt, seven, uh, what's that, 18th century, um, trains, telephones, bicycles, internal combustion engines, running <laughs> carts, coming up to industrial agriculture, air transport, uh, linear packaging systems, which I will talk a little bit about later, uh, uh, container shipping. It's a kind of a computer, internet, mobile phones. We're producing this year 2.6 billion mobile phones, which is kind of an interesting figure. Uh, if you ask Nokia's design manager, which I did in London this spring, he's, and I asked him, do you um, have a plan for what's happening with those mobile phones once they, ha once they have been used? And the answer was no, they don't. <laughs> which kind of interesting. Of course, as you well know, this, this all kind of human activity is creating a lot of, of, of trouble. So I thought I wanted to use an example by Shell Arleklet, a professor in Uppsala, he once uh, told us this example. I don't know if some of you have heard it, perhaps. But this is just to kind of try to quantify what's, why is this kind of liquid so interesting. <laughs> this is one deciliter of petrol, and it equals, equals one kilowatt hour. And what he told us, the, the kind of work you can, you can carry out with this amount of petrol is to lift a car of 1,200 kilos up to the top of the Eiffel Tower. That's the amount of work. And that's about the equivalent of 25 slaves working for one day. You know, if you could imagine, they're carrying this stuff up 300 meters. That's the kind of work you, you execute. And if you don't translate that into uh, what you would use it for normally, uh, you can imagine yourself at the you know, petrol station filling your car. And that would be the equivalent of 12,500 slaves one day. That's kind of work you're putting into your car, which will actually go for pulling that car. You could try to pull your own car. It's a lot of work. Sweden, um, pioneers in environmental work, as you well know. We have invested for 75 years or 80 years in this transportation system, and we are now kind of suffering from it, as you well know. We have a lot of cars, 4.5 million driving far distances, big country, 6.6 billion kilometers, 165 billion slave working days is executed by this amount. And this stuff is normally sold in these quantities. I saw this, um, um, you know, how much this kind of vessel will take. It's about 2 million barrels. One barrel is 158 liters. And then I made a little bit of calculation. But this is what the transportation fuel for Sweden is for one year. It's about 24 super tankers. I thought, that, well, that sounds quite a lot. Yeah? But then I, I checked out the world oil production, which is today 97 million barrels per day. And I translated this into super tankers. And I couldn't fit it into one screen, so it had to be three screens. So in relation to that, you can see that Swedish transportation needs is quite, it's not so much. It's about 16,800 super tankers of oil that's being used every year. And if you look at the uh, this, um, uh, graphics of Stefan Anderberg, there you can see that there is about three times more uh, in terms of fossil fuel. If you think about um, fossil gas and fossil coal, so you can imagine that you set this on fire, three times 16,800 super tankers every year. And you would expect that there are no problems. <laughs> I, f I find that a little bit naive. Because, but what is a bit encouraging is that perhaps this was the la largest amount of oil that was ever used, because a lot of people think that, like you harvest any ending resource, whether it will be strawberries or in this case, oil, th this is what you will look at. So we're just at the top of that. Problem is, of course, that we are not really acknowledging that fact, but we are continuing to plan in this way. 
and this could perhaps be a, sort of a monument of this era, if you call it the, the, the oil era. And what, we, what is significant for this kind of, of um, if you call it, um, retail concepts or distribution concepts is that most of the stuff that's being sold is produced somewhere else. Uh, it's based on, in principle, colonial time principles. You produce in one economy, and you use a lot of fossil fuel to transport it to another economy where you can sell it more dearly. And by doing so, making a little bit more money. And then, as you can see, there is a transportation system based on fossil fuel that is like taking the customers to the store and back. And uh, I've heard that it's about 4.5 million car journeys to this uh, uh, shopping mall alone. So there's a lot of energy used. And why are we doing all this? <laughs> I think this is a, 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 Czech, a guy from Czech Republic who quite well summarized the kind of dominating uh, kind of norm for how we should live our lives, which is probably driving this uh, development, I would guess. But the question we always ask ourselves if we're into sustainable development is, of course, can we do this indefinitely? Of course we can't. We need a a compass, you know, how are we going to get out of that? Um, there are some intelligent people cycling, as you can see. Uh, so I thought, Hima, there must be something hidden in this message, you know, there's a formula. I couldn't claim that I can, you know, understand the full potential of this formula, but the mass there, mass, weight, you know, moving a lot of things around means that you use more energy. This is what we, where we should be going, I guess, no? This sounds more promising, you know. Ambitious, but not probably not ambitious uh, enough. This is Richard Rogers, Lord Rogers, architect. Very good book, Cities for a Small Planet, where he suggests how we should plan our cities. I can only agree. We need to go from separating functions to create um, overlapping, diversified uh, urban situations where you don't need... Um, automobile to transport yourself around. It's not that difficult. And you can be encouraged by that. As you see, the most efficient uh, ways of transportation is actually the electrified public transport. So that kind of supports our idea of how we can transform this. This is some students from France, from Saint-Étienne, did an experiment to visualize the, 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 the occupancy of different kinds of transportation systems, which is kind of nice visually. We need to more, be more intelligent when we plan cities. We need to plan in three dimensions. You know? We tend to plan in with zoning, uh, separating function, but we need to get everything overlapping. We need to create diversified environments by planning in, in, in three dimensions, volume planning. Um, this is the way it could look. You know? Fantastic, diversified, lively environment. Uh, good transportation system, enormously much higher capacity than if there would have been cars on this street. Good, 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 no noise, um, no emissions. Here I did a little bit of study just to support my idea uh, that the carrying capacity if you do your weekly shopping, in Sweden 71% of the weekly shopping is done by car. And do you really need to buy 500 kilos every week if you have a family? I don't think so. I have a transportation bike, a bicycle, fantastic, it's enough. And if you compare the kind of perspective, what you're looking at, if you're having these two means of transportation, uh, you can see what the stupendous amount of resources you're using for, for getting your food uh, back to your flat. Doesn't seem to make f sense if you consider the the consequences, you get good exercise if you cycle, no emissions, you silence, space efficient, no greenhouse gas emission, if you drive, no exercise, obesity, big problem, uh, particle emissions, noise, much space, greenhouse gas emission. It seems to be pretty easy. And another thing is that we have to move away from linear thinking to, to, towards cyclist thinking. I will mention this because I have an example with a brewery, how we should think when we organize a city. This is a linear packaging system, very bad. 
uh, you take two, you mix um, two materials, out of which one is becomes very toxic when, when, it, when it's getting destructed, and you create toxic waste, a linear system. Yeah? This is a cyclic system, you know? much more intelligent. You don't create waste. You, know? you bring your bottles back to the brewery, you drink, no problem. If you have a good transportation system, this is the way you can think if you want to plan for distributing uh, beer or products from a brewery. Because they contain about 99% water. So this is kind of an intelligent way of o o organizing it. This is kind of a principle. Yeah? So first of all, we need to place the brewery in a good position. Then we need to establish good transportation systems based on electrified transport and soft mobility, which is kind of a name for walking and cycling, which sounds much more sophisticated. Yeah, that's why I like to use that. This is how it could look like. Not that difficult, is it? If a little bit, oh, it has been done before. <laughs> My god. I sort of knew that it has been done before. No? And if you look at most of the cities in the world, you can normally draw a line uh, at about 1920, 1930, before the individual automobile came in as the major dominating transportation system, and you can see that they're fairly well planned. This happened to be Stockholm. Uh, and you can see that this is not planned for automobiles. Uh, this is um, Bolnes, a small city, but this looks like a very civilized uh, kind of street environment. <laughs> So it has been done before. Good public transport could look fantastic. Um, regional transportation system, electrified, intelligent, comfortable uh, traveling. International traveling. This is the new line between London and Paris in two hours, 15 minutes, I think. Uh, roughly the time it takes you to get to Heathrow in rush hours from central London. Much more intelligent. Intelligent way of distributing water packaging system, they do exist. This is in Japan, small village, no problem. Fill the bottles, bring them back. Interesting way of distributing uh, food, you know, local level, local produce, no transportation, or very little transportation. Organizing a very good resource efficient system, in this case a restaurant. You know, you don't throw away, throw away very much of this. This is the kind of innovations we need to do. This is from Oslo. You know? We spend a lot of time thinking about we need terribly sophisticated technology, but it, it's already there. You know? It's just a matter of making the right uh, choices, I would say. So I think I will finish with this image, which is kind of a nice street uh, profile, which allows you for pushing your uh, trolley bag no problem. Thank you very much.